Good evening, everybody. And thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm so glad that everybody found a seat because I was hearing, there aren't enough seats, there aren't enough seats. This is a very popular event. We're thrilled that you're all here. Um, the Sound Foundation brings together tonight two eminent designers who will share their insights on the remarkable impact of the Henry Davis Sleeper Beauport House and the effect that it's had on modern design. I'm Paul Whalen, and I'm chairman of the Sir John Soane's Museum Foundation. And on behalf of my fellow trustees, I'd like to thank Jonathan Hogg, chair of our public program committee, as well as our executive director, Bill Appleton, who many of you met walking in the room, uh, for their work on this event. We at the foundation really appreciate that you share our passion for the Sonian world of art, architecture, and design. We invite you to join us for our remaining programs this spring, including an online lecture next Wednesday, March 29th at noon, by Tim Knox, the director of the Royal Collection and a former director of the Sone Museum. If you haven't already registered for Tim's talk, uh, we invite you to do that and uh, to join us for his lecture on the uh, friendly rivalry between John Sone and Thomas Hope. So for tonight, we have a wonderful tandem lined up for you um, with Mitch Owen and Thomas Jane. Mitch Owens has recently joined the Foundation's Board of Directors. Welcome, Mitch. We're thrilled to have you. Um, he's, he is the American editor of the World of Interiors and has been a design journalist since the early 1980s, as well as, elect, as a lecturer on architecture and design, the history of decoration, collecting, and garden design. He has held executive positions at Architectural Digest and El Decor, been a reporter for the New York Times, and a contributing editor at Travel and Leisure, Departures, and other publications. He is currently working on a biography of the 1960s style icon, Pauline de Rothschild, Rothschild perhaps, uh, which will be published by Rizzoli. Exciting news. Thomas Jane founded Jane Design Studio in 1990. His academic training has greatly influenced his, his design philosophy. He received a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Oregon School of Architecture and Allied Arts. After receiving his master's degree from Winter Tours Museum program in, in uh, American Material Culture and the Decorative Arts, he continued his research through advanced fellowship at the, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Historic Deerfield, and the J. Paul Getty Museum before moving on to a position at Christie's Estates and Appraisal Department. His interest in architecture and the decorative arts eventually led him to pursue a career in interior design. He worked for Parrish Hadley and Associates and Kevin McNamara before opening his own studio. And I have to say, I didn't know all that about Thomas. It's amazing. It's very impressive. He's going to know everything. Um, before turning the evening over to Mitch and Thomas and to provide you a little context for the connection between Sone and Sleeper, I'm going to turn your attention briefly to, um, and it, well, here's an aerial view of, um, of Beauport. We'll get back to that. But I just wanted to show you a comparison and scale between Sir John Sone's Museum and Beauport House. I think more of you have probably been to Sir John Sone's Museum, even though it's much further away than Beauport is. And you can see that Sir John Sone's Museum, of course, is a little thing uh, in three townhouses in London. And that Beauport, and I've seen Beauport, and I thought, oh, what a charming, lovely place but it really is a huge, rambling American country house uh, built over a number of years. Um, uh, I want to note that uh, in, in analyzing these two plans, I thought it was interesting that both houses have rooms that are almost always entered on corners, which is interesting because it's much less formal than entering in the center, and it means that you always get a kind of picturesque diagonal view of the room. But Sir John Sone's museum does have organizing axes that go through it and pull it together because he was a classically trained architect. And um, uh, whereas uh, Sleeper was well-educated, well but, but he was not a trained architect, his rooms are, are pulled together in a very casual way, but in a way that really does make sense visually when you're there. It's almost like going in a walk, on a walk through the country. They're, they're very casually arranged. Um, so, and I, it's worth noting that, that John Soane's museum was designed for the public, so it had to have a kind of clarity to it. 
uh, he, was, he meant to, for it to go on as a museum after he died, and of course it has. And so those axes do help visitors find their way around, sort of, it's quite complicated. But Beauport was designed for Henry Sleeper himself and his close circle of friends. And if you were invited, I think, to Henry Sleeper's house, you'd already been there. It, you couldn't possibly have gone for the first time, I think. And you, um, and you knew your way around. So those are just a couple of architectural uh, thoughts about this. And now, uh, uh, Thomas and Mitch, if you could please come up, uh, you're going to hear a lot more about the decorating and collecting that Henry Sleeper did over a lifetime. Okay. <clears throat> well, I guess we're all right then. Thomas and I were trying to figure out if the room was crowded because you liked us or because you like Henry Davis sleep. So we're going to take a poll later. That's called a trick question. It is a trick question, isn't it? Um, to start out, I'm, I'm going to give a tiny introduction, I hope it's small, um, introduction about Beauport. Um, Beauport House, or, or Little Beauport, as it originally was in size and name, um, is one of the most curious, appealing, and confounding of American houses, even now more than a century after it was begun. Um, it's located on the eastern point, overlooking Gloucester Harbor on Boston's North Shore. And I, I love the house in a, in a, in a major way because it, it as, as Paul was saying, um, it just sort of rambles. It's like a dog on its property trying to find a scent. Um, so it keeps switching back and going forward and going up and going down. Um, the architect of the structure which began to take place in 1908 was a Norwegian-born Hafton Hansen, who I, I love, had, was only 24, and he just completed a correspondence course in architecture um, when, when, um, uh, when Sleeper decided to hire him. Um, Sleeper was about a decade his senior um, uh, moneyed Bostonian bachelor. I think we could call him um, an antiquarian, a collector, a, a fantasist uh, with a passion for the past, rather like Soane, and a sublime instinct for nesting. Um, Like-minded friends of sleepers um, aesthetically and in, um, in terms of sexual identity had been colonizing <laughs> Eastern Point um, in recent years and Beauport would be tucked amid their residences and become the best known. Indeed it was described as the most photographed house in America during sleepers lifetime. Wow. Um, which surely um, explains why, we're going forward, here you see just facing the harbor, here another uh, floor plan. Um, I wanted to go forward, but now I'm not having much luck. There we go. So then you, th this, this will give you some general idea of the interiors of, of how a Sleeper arranged things inside his house, rather like sewn with the stained glass and the, the, the constant repetition of objects. Um, but in Sleeper's case, not for scholarship, but for decoration, as Thomas will um, talk to us about. Thank you. I'm just not certain why I'm doing it incorrectly. So here's, here's Sleeper uh, as a young man. Oh, here's, okay, I need to go back. Here we go. So t t Sleeper had a, his apartment in Boston was the previous slide, which you see here, this sort of horror vacui um, of Victorian uh, taste, um, but also in the sense of he's already, I think, using decorative items as, as architecture, as decoration in a way, so that you have all of these etchings, which, which might as well be boiserie, uh, the way they're all laid out, much in the way that um, Sohn did in that room that we just saw. So Sleeper's friends um, included, so we, see, we have Sleeper here on the right, um, Mrs. Gardner, Isabella Stewart Gardner, uh, sitting up in between um, on, the, on the rear. Um, so, um, everyone from uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner to the Crown Prince of Sweden and his royal British wife came to visit, dine, and marvel and attend um, fancy dress parties. Um, like Soane's house in Lincoln's Inn Fields, uh, the 56-room house was an extravaganza of artifice, an orgy of special effects, spatial inventions, varied themes and historical architectural elements and decorative arts handled with very little regard for history and where atmosphere triumphed over accuracy. Um, Justice Soane's residence has been called 
the most fascinating residence in England, I think it's fair to say that Sleeper's House remains um, the most fascinating house in America. And in fact, a 1940 article, six years after Sleeper's death, continued to publicize it as the most interesting home in America. Uh, when tonight's conversation was publicized and quickly sold out, I know that members of the Board of Trustees of the Sir John Soane's Museum Foundation were inundated with emails and text messages from architects and designers who said that Beauport was their favorite house. And we received just as many from people who said it was their favorite house, although they hadn't been there yet. Um, so I, I, I hope that tonight's uh, uh, discussion will encourage you to go. It's only in Boston. Um, it's just it's not very far away. Uh, so you can go at any time. Uh, Thomas, you're, you're firmly in the former camp, an experienced explorer of that house. Um, so I'd, I'd like to know from, from your viewpoint, uh, what is it about Sleeper and, and Beauport that has occupied a collective psyche for so long? Magic. Magic, okay. I, I, I think it's magical. And, and, and um, all of us like to go to places where we are surprised but also feel comfortable. And I think Sleeper was a genius at hospitality and making rooms that you wanted to be in but also had an aspect of surprise. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like the, the jacket with a surprise lining or right. um, uh, 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 something uh, uh, in food, there's a, a second taste that comes forward. Sleeper rewards us with, with, with rooms you can understand that are immediately beautiful and then have an element of, of surprise, or if magic. Mm. And of course, this room, it's one of his most famous rooms. The Golden Step Room. Um, and I, I included it in my first book. I wrote a book called 50, um, uh, the, f the Finest Rooms in America, 50 Influential Interiors from the 18th Century to the Present. Uh, uh, Elizabeth White helped me with the title. She's here tonight. And it's a very long title. But um, I felt like this room was very influential because of its um, <coughs> use of location and color. And um, it is right on the Gloucester uh, bay, and it, it, you can imagine the light bouncing in off it, almost like Venice, and the windows, in a very modern way, um, fall into the floor so that you have an outdoor porch. And, and here he took um, many like things and then painted them the same color for a repetition that gives them a modernity. And also he played other objects of the same color but of different use against them in, in an amazingly artful way. And it is, although it's a country house and a, and a, a country room, it's of extreme refinement. And I remember you were, you were also pointing out that although this room speaks to a colonial gene in terms of, of collecting and objects, it also it speaks to the Art Deco yeah. period in, in terms of its palette. Yes. Uh, and and uh, one of the things that we talk about in, the, in our office, I'm a decorator, obviously, is um, no matter how accurate you want to make something, how true to a time and generation you want to be, when it's all done and you step, step back, even a half, you know, a decade, it, it, it's of its own period. And, and this is an example where he probably thought he was making a 19th century room, but it, it turns out to be a, a very 20, 20th century room. So I wonder how much he was thinking about that because I know that just before he, um, started work on Beauport, there was an enormous amount of, of interest in colonial America. Yeah. Uh, museum wings were opening, uh, the Essex Peabody, um, uh, various and sundry uh, or organizations were, were focusing on colonial America. And, and he, he started out very early on um, with a great interest in Pilgrim and Jacobean furniture, and that seems to have flown by the wayside very quickly in terms of the assemblage of objects. He was right. assembling ar ar architectural elements that were 18th century rooms taken from like the Cogswell House right. and incorporating them into Beauport as it was being built, but then putting in Jacobean furniture, which had no place in an 18th century um, panel room. But I, so I, I'm wondering how much, he, he wasn't, how much of it was scholarship and how much of it was just fun with decorating? Well. It's very rare to have a designer who 
is intuitive and intellectual at the same time. And, and thank you. Um, so, for example, at, at Beauport, there's a case of silver that's beautifully arranged, but it's also by the patriot silversmith Paul Revere. <laughs> I think that's the greatest example of being intellectual and artistic at the same time. Right. And, and, and I think he loved history, but I think he loved beautiful things arranged beautifully more. Mm. And um, there's a whole cast of people who are collecting and displaying in the turn of the 19th to 20th century. Uh, uh, Mrs. Gardner, Henry Francis DuPont, um, Doylestown, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes, you know, they're obviously interested in saving and preserving and displaying history, but they also wanted it to look attractive. Um, Mr. DuPont famously entertained Mrs. Kennedy at Winterthur, and she said, I want people to know that American rooms can be swell. And, and, and that sort of harkens back to that idea of, of display and history and how objects are used to communicate history, but also to communicate beauty. Right, and, I, and what, what's interesting too about Beauport is how very early on Sleeper was looking at it as a, a series of rooms, thematic rooms that addressed American history, not necessarily accurately, but American history from the beginning of the colonies to the late 18th century. It was supposed to sort of be a, like a Rolodex of, of, right. of great moments in, in American decorating. Um, there, a, a biographer named Paul Hollister it was, as, as a child remembers Sleeper telling him, um, mightn't it be fun to have a house in which each room could recapture some of the spirit of a specific mood or phrase or period of our American life? And of course we tried to do that with museums and period rooms. Uh, right. Countless institutions you know, had a 17th century room and then through the 18th and early 19th century um, and, and, and the whole argument of the, displaying particularly the decorative arts in a context so that you could understand them better. Mm. And, and that went out of style. And there's still a few museums that have period rooms. And, and for example, the Met. And right. That's a great example of how they work and how they don't work. Or no one wants to live in a period room, but they're in, instructive. And for a time, we used to decorate rooms that were period rooms but we soon learned they were uncomfortable. Right. And about that time I made this phrase up that you have to have, in a, in a room, you have to have at least one thing from your own time and generation or it looks awfully bad. <laughs> well, which, which, which certainly um, a Sleeper did. He, he mixed in all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of things. I'm looking at those milk glass um, goblets on that table facing the harbor. Well, they're actually clear and he put a colored oh, ball they? inside of them for a light effect. Oh, okay. which is, it's just, it, it, I, I just noticed this the other day. It's like, oh gosh, he has, he has like a float in the middle of those, because anyway. He had lots of floats. So here's the other end of the, the other end of the step room. Again, this, this, this repetition of objects, so that it's, 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 it's almost less objects and more just about rhythm. Right. And you, you walk into that room and it's, it's very peaceful, but, but not because it's, I mean, it's, it's definitely crowded. But it's very peaceful because it is this sort of rhythmic music going all the way around the room. And, and one of the great luxuries in life is to have a room dedicated to having parties. And this room definitely was a party room. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, uh, Martha Stewart copied it in the 80s. So it, 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 you know, it's interesting how a room can re reverb. Um, right, I mean, but I think that's the great thing about Sleep Run, about Beauport. Um, it, when, when we were having the, our, our preliminary discussion about about Beauport, we, were, we, we talked a lot about how it influenced, of, of all people, you know, our, our parents and our, our grandparents, yes. you know, whether, whether they knew it was Beauport or not, that was driving them. Um, we'll bring that up later. Um, but I, I love, the, what, I, what I love about Beauport too is, you know, like, like I was saying about Sleeper wanting to have this sort of um, sweep of American history from room to room to room, he ran out of space. So he kept buying up adjacent properties and adjacent land so that he could eventually have 56 rooms <coughs> that, that could um, address all different and sundry parts of American, American history or his invented idea of American history. I think that's called manifest destiny. Yes, it is. <laughs> Just keep on buying keep up the buying, neighbors. Keep buying until you run out. And, and I love this. This is the octagon room, which uh -huh. is an octagon. Um, 
and it, it contains a sleeper's collection of red tollware. And this is a painting by uh, Rankin, who was a great friend of, of, of his. But again, we see another, another aspect of the repetition that you see at Beauport is, um, I mean, when was the last time any of us used a rag rug? Um, in, in any space, but Beauport's packed with them. Well, you do, <laughs> of course you do. But here's, here's a photograph of the room. But again, this, 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 rhythm, this rhythm of color and, and pattern and, and trays, and, and again, architecture, creating architecture within architecture. So it's an, this is a clear example of using objects to decorate, and it's not about their historical use, it's how these historic objects look good together. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he went on a few buying trips to Paris to get all this tollware. Or a um, few benders. It's, it's like shopping eBay late at night with a bottle of wine. Uh -huh. Where you end up with red toll is that trays. Kibe? Is that eBay or hoarders? Hoarders, one of the two. <laughs> well, he was definitely a hoarder, but he arranged it very beautifully. Yeah. And I, I think that's the one thing to learn <laughs> about, about sleepers' rooms is that they are packed, but they are orderly. Were they, were, were, were they hoarders? Yeah. Were they hoarders, precisely. Um. And again, the, the glass is a huge part of Beauport, and this is one of the things Thomas and I were, were talking about. Um, I mean, I you know, see direct parallels to my grandmother in Kentucky putting blue cobalt glass on windowsills, um, different and sundry vessels, some very nice and some not so nice, but the idea of the the light streaming through into a room, very much like the stained glass at, 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 at the Sun Museum. Yes. Well, well um, light through glass is very changeable and, and, and atmospheric. And it's also, uh, we were talking about this the other day in the office, that, that they could do this because there was a, enough colored glass to do it. America started manufacturing colored glass in the 1820s, mm -hmm. and by 1910, there was a, a lot of it around, and it could be arranged in category and color, and, and, and so that it was really a product of industrialization that allowed that to happen, because in the Georgian period, rich people had stained glass, but they, didn't, they certainly didn't have enough colored vessels to fill windows. Right, nor did they, um, take salvaged windows and create display cases that are then backlit right. to look like windows, which was a, a, another great part of Beauport. I remember the first time I ever went there, it was just like salvage heaven. Right. Um, I just thought, you know, I was thinking back to some Brimfield visit and thinking, why did I pass up that window? <laughs> um, I could do that at home, couldn't I? But that's sort of the, 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 a, a lovely takeaway from, from Beauport is this, you know, if, if you have one or two, it's it's, it's not a collection, but if you have 20, it, it's definitely a collection, whether they're good or not. Yeah, and the ability to collect critical mass so you can do it is interesting. And here you, you, you have the, the, the lavender, the purple glass at, at Beauport backlit, and then here another Rankin uh, painting of one of Beauport's interiors showing it in, in its actual um, installation as, as it is now. I think, I think part of the reason he liked it is because it was changeable. Right. You know, it wasn't moved, like the water that the house is on. It, it, the light really enlivened his, uh, Beaupart is very alive because of the light, and the light comes from the colored glass and the water that it's beside it. So it's, even though it's static in a sense it's not rearranged any longer, the changeability of the lighting mm -hmm. really makes it fresh. Well, and there's also, there's, there's a lot of windows, a lot of glass in that house, yeah. more so than you would expect from walking up to it, particularly on the harbor side where there are all those sort of mismatched bits salvaged from um, 18th and 19th century buildings and sort of just sort of tucked here and there, yeah. you know, shuttered uh, recesses where, you know, open one and there's a, a stone statue of, of, of a saint, which doesn't really belong on an arts and crafts building, but it looks pretty wonderful. As does this really large, sort of almost like a shop window. Um, almost like the way that the, the the, the installation is at the, at the British rooms, at the, at the Met. Oh, yeah. The way, this, like you were saying about this critical mass of, of color and material. So it's arguable, but it probably Henry Sleeper did not have anything in his house that didn't go together into the composition. True. And that was beautiful. Mm.
and then here more glass, and then you have the, the little floats lined up along the window uh, over the harbor. And he even took floats and stuck them in the tops of pediment, open pediments, um, where somebody else would have a little bust or something. They were like a red glass float um, at the top all the way through the house. And again, here you have a window that, that's a double-sided window, but it's looking into another window on, on the other side of an, uh, sort of a, uh, uh, um, uh, an open space between two spots of the house. Here's the belfry bedroom, which I know you like, yeah, I love and that I one. like. And, and again, this, this application of Chinese export wallpaper in a way that it would never have been used in the heyday of Chinese export wallpaper. Chinese paper was extremely expensive and very rare. And today, we're used to seeing it in decorating because there's companies that reproduce it. Mm. Um, but and it's put into rooms very seriously. Right. You know, great expanses of space wrapped in a garden, whereas, you know, whereas here it's an, it's an attic space it, with all these cutouts. The genius is that it sort of obfuscates the, or it makes the, the dormers better because of the paper. And the, in real life, it's a very beautiful color. The, the ground is a little more, is bluer. Right. And the trim is definitely green, but not to that strength. And the, um, it's being photographed during the day but at night, was it, when the lanterns were going, it, it has a different effect. Um, and his, uh, his uh, the abundance of old textiles that he uses um, widely in the rooms is part of a tradition that continued into the 20th century. Um, but you know, the, the perfect jacquard bed cover that matches mm. the wallpaper that goes with the old chintz box spring. Um, a lot of thought. And well, also, too, what I, what I love about the Belfry bedroom is that there was, you know, this, this is newly constructed, but, but within it, he and, 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 and Hansen have sliced out areas of, of the wall to fit things. So, right. I mean, this here, like sort of a, a, a pier mirror with, with a lamp coming out of the, the, the angle. I mean, it's, it's a nutty room and, and pretty wonderful. It's, it's put together like a collage. So the, and the, uh, Sleeper used the house for house parties, so he had lots of bedrooms, and you, the, you slept in the bedroom a weekend, so mm -hmm. it, it wasn't you know, a permanent bedroom, so that makes a difference. And the, the thing that I thought was most interesting about our early discussion, though, was you know, what is this the prime regenerator to? And I was thinking, and we came up with Tony Duquette. Right. And it was just, you know, it's, it's like collecting the dots. Um, right, I mean, pe people who are collecting you know, critical mass, but also very inventively assembling things in a repetitive fashion. Yeah, and 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 uh, Tony had a certain thematicness to his house, mm. and Henry Sleeper has a theme. That that's something I hadn't thought about. These people who collect and display about what what is their theme, what is their agenda. Mr. Dupont obviously loved Americana. Mm. Henry Sleeper loved beauty and and. It would just be interesting to go ID those people and you know, why are they doing this. Um. No, and it's interesting. It, it's, it's interesting because his is, Sleepers is, has more of a, a free form um, a, a approach to, to combining all these different periods. I mean, they're, they're sort of, you know, in, in, in general, but then suddenly you have this wonderful, strange glass urn in the, in the corner. Again, against this great wall of glass that would never have been in a colonial house ever. I mean, and that's certainly assembled from various and sundry places. I, I, I love the Belfry room. It's, 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 it's a very happy room. And this is one of your favorite rooms, the, the, the tower room, the, the library, with, just, with the lovely the, carved uh, curtains. The whole of, Mr. Victoria. The whole of was talking about your carved curtains. Yeah. I always think it's absurd because why have a round library when books are square? Exactly <laughs> true. It's just, it's just, it's just it, it defies logic. Of course, the whole house defies logic. Right. I, I remember going into the, this, this room. There, there, there's also another uh, round room. And, and getting very close and looking and realizing on top of wallpaper, not in this room, but in another room, he'd actually decoupaged little um, figures cut out from um, 19th and 18th century etchings and sort of glued them in, into place, rather like that 
English aristocrat glued birds onto her Chinese export wallpaper. Oh yeah, she cut Audubon up, birds. She cut up her fo Audubon. Her Audubon folio. Yeah. yeah, everyone should do that. As long as you have a scissor, why not? Weren't, weren't those weren't the red curtains from a mortuary or? I think they were they from were, a mortuary. Yeah, yeah, and the windows were cut they, to match. They were redecorated and. But this, the, but this is what I love about it. The, the thing about, about, about Sleeper is it, it, there are moments where you're completely unsure if anything's any good. It just looks great. And, and that sort of, I think, is sort of the point. I remember um, going to, to Tefaf a couple of years ago and the Roman dealer Alessandra Bronca had some wonderful paintings of horses in, in her booth and I stupidly said, who painted them? And she said, does it matter? They're beautiful. <laughs> and I, th I thought, well, that's true. But I, I think Sleeper is very much the same way. It gives you a lot of, Beauport gives you a lot of freedom. It suspends disbelief and it suspends um, the need to be scholarly in a way. Except you had a vast amount of stuff to pick from so that all the objects were beautiful. You can, it's like, when, but I think you hole. could get the effect. I mean, that's sort of what I like about it. Is I wanted to go home and decorate and, and think, you know, I don't, I don't need a spare <coughs> tabletop. I can cram as many things as I want that's true. onto it. I mean, I have one of these, but, the little but finding, uh, the tree on cast iron. I have six of them, actually. <laughs> but who knows what I'm going to do with them. Well, But I love this. I think this is a terrific space at, at, at Beauport. And then the, 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 um, the China Trade Room, which before it was the China Trade Room, it was, it was the hall at, at Beauport, as you see on the, the left, and it was rather Jacobean um, in, in style, but by the 1920s, um, uh, Sleeper and, and Houghton were, were recreating it into this sort of chop suey, <laughs> modern, um, um, what, what was that great movie with, um, um, uh, you know, Mary Tyler Moore, what was it called? It's like that movie, you know. Did, did, he, did, did he do that or did his, the next family? No, they redecorated it. This was Sleeper. That's Sleeper. This is Sleeper. And then they, they, they did a different version. Woolworth's daughter, Helena, yeah. cleaned it up and made it more of a sitting, Georgian sitting room, but the paper still. She made there. it look more like Winotaur, which I've Yeah, she did make it more like, like Winotaur. But I, but I love this, he's, he's, he's always changing the house. It, it, is, it is always in flux. The, the letters between him and, and Hafton are, are very funny. There's, there's one moment where, where um, Sleeper is at a spa where he's, he's laid up for some reason and he starts out the letter, I know that you're very heavily burdened with my previous requests, but, and then there's this whole long paragraph of other things he wants him to do. And, and he's, he's, he's talking about some paneling that's going to be arriving and will need a, a room to be built to contain it. And so he tells Hafton it's going to be called the Cogswell Room um, because he's removed all the paneling from a house that was falling down. So, so what's, what's the chain of succession? You, you have the chain of succession? You have, well. Oops, as I swing it around and kill people. Um, there's sleeper. The chain of succession for the house? Well, no. Who comes first, Mrs. Gardner or Sleeper? That's a very good idea. And then, well, Mrs. Gardner is, uh, was slightly younger than Sleeper, correct? No, she's slightly older than Sleeper. Um, but then, she's doing the same thing with her house. She's tearing things apart and sticking them on the walls, and you know, fabrics and gowns and tapestries and hanging things, a simulacrum of a palazzo and, or a florent, but not. And then, Sleeper advises formally Mr. Dupont. Henry right, Francis Dupont. And then, who comes next? You. I, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> not that fast. Um, Tony Duquet is. He's in the movie industry when Sleeper's there. What about Keith Irvine? <coughs> Keith Irvine. Well, with that, with that density and repetition of objects and color and. There's something of, of that in him. And it's, it just, it would be really interesting to, to, to do a, a, connect the dots with these guys. Because their influence is really strong. Right. But. Well, and by the time, by, by the 1940s, I mean, as, as I had said in the introduction, Beauport 
I mean, although it wasn't the most fashionable house in America, it was the best known house in America, mm -hmm. largely because it was just repeatedly published from 1910 until Sleeper's death and then onward through the 50s and 60s, it still kept showing up. I have a, I have a theory. I think the house was really a pop, popular because it had a, a, a slew of decorating ideas, mm -hmm. meaning that there was things that you could do to your own house. You could take your Windsor chairs and paint them all one color. You could buy an old lamp mm -hmm. and wire it. You, a, a lot of what he did was replicated in countless houses as almost DIY. Right. But that's sort of what this house is. It's 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 a it's a patchwork itself of of of, of, of Hansen and Sleeper coming up with all of these ideas. I mean, there seems to be almost no other guiding light than those two, and they're sort of yeah. slapping things together in, in a really exciting way. How much license do you think they had from the 19th century, from from those interiors like his Boston house that allowed people to jam interiors full of things they liked in artistic ways. Right. Made this not so foreign. I mean, no, no, it's not that foreign at all. It's just, it's just more measured and rhythmic and, and, and uh, ordered, ordered. I mean, the, the, the density has been cut by half and what's left is, is ordered in a really strong way. Right. Graphic. It's, it is ordered. And this is what Mrs. McCann did to the Chinese, the China trade room. Um, she turned it into a, a, a living room. It's interesting she felt the need to do that. But she didn't touch the rest of the house. But she, like she needed relief in the middle of it all. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there, there are wonderful pictures of the, of, of the McCann's. Um, Mrs. McCann was a Woolworth heiress, Barbara Hutton's aunt. And um, they're, they're entertaining in the house. They're having picnics all over the place. And then this is the only room that they changed and the only room they look comfortable in. Uh. But the most popular room, weirdly enough, of the, of the time was um, in many, many ways the pine kitchen that, that Sleeper made this sort of wonderfully artificial early American pilgrim-ish kitchen. And all of these incredible rich people wanted, that wanted one. Um, everybody, no matter what their house was, um, whatever style it was, they, they, they wanted a... Um, a, a colonial kitchen out of Beauport. And, and, and then they called him on, you know, advising on how to create it. So I've got a few here. Um, this is the, hold on, here we go. I figure if I bring the forward. I have to go over your head, sir. Is that working? Paul, thank you very much. So this is the, the house uh, in, very nearby, done, by, uh, done for the Bretonals who were, he was a, a, a minister. And, and, and I love that this, they're, they're almost like show kitchens. I mean, they're, they're, they're fake kitchens where there's a real kitchen elsewhere in the house. Um, but you've got this very picturesque one where you can have breakfast well, and dine and have coffee and all sorts of things. I mean, it's not like they have the latest stove sitting out in the middle of it all. It segues into those, what we call the tavern rooms where people would put an informal room in their basement to have parties. Right. And that was exactly parallel to Prohibition. Um, so they were private drinking spaces in private houses um, to give parties where you didn't have to worry about marring the mahogany or right. breaking the Right, it was the the, like dishes. the English pub in the basement. Yeah, there, that, that was a strong. And this is um, at Winterthur. Yep. This is um, Mr. DuPont's uh, original version of his pine kitchen. Is that Southampton, Southampton or is this, is this Southampton or is this Winterthur? Well, anyway, it, it, it's the same. Anyway. Sorry. But, uh, but Sleeper advised du DuPont on his, on his house at Southampton yeah. as, as well as Winterthur. And then here is um, an, another one of um, Sleeper's um, pine kitchens for a client. And then you've, you've got this great porch that's very much like Sleeper's porch at Beauport facing yeah. The water, it's sort of a combination of that loggia as well as the golden step room. Right. And then here you have Win Winterthur with, with this great you know, repetition of, 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 of plates and objects. Again, very heavily influenced in the rag rugs. Yeah. I mean, I would love to have seen those two together talking about all of this because I think uh, uh, 
sleeper is invited to Winterthur in 1930, and he doesn't show up. Or, or, or he sends a note like the day before and says, I can't come. And then the next year he comes. And I'd love to see Sleeper and DuPont um, sitting around and talking about this shared you know, craze for, for Americana and what they're going to do. Yes. That was a lot of Mr. DuPont's social life, was talking to taste advisors about what to do with Winotour. It was a real outlet for him. And here's Mr. DuPont's own sort of China trade room. That's one of the finest rooms in America, too. Right. Yeah. And then here is at Winterthur, colored glass a la sleeper right. installed uh, with that same backlit idea of almost like a shop window. Classic. Now, sleeper, of course, became, uh, although he's, he's known for Beauport, he had a lot of at least 17 to 20 decorating projects that we know about, one of which is the Yalka House in Newport that was done for the oleo margarine millionaire. Um, and um, this is. Uh, the, the, the drawing room that uh, Sleeper worked on. But as you can see through it, there's the pine kitchen that the Yalkas needed um, in their house, although it has no resemblance or, 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 or association with this particular room, very much like Sleeper's own interiors. And then here's uh, Mrs. Yalka in her colonial kitchen, just off of that drawing room. Wow. And then you've got um, uh, Frederick March, the movie star, hired a uh, sleeper to come out to Hollywood and, and decorate uh, his house. And here's the, the dining room at Fre Frederick March's place. And then this, I think, is a, a really mad but wonderful room in uh, Middleburg, uh, uh, Virginia, the Thomas house. That, uh, this is Mr. Thomas's bedroom uh, with this sort of crazy um, Chinese furniture, sort of Brighton Pavilion-esque. Wow. Uh, but again, um, sleeper using things that, that the client had already purchased, but bringing in um, his, his, his own things. Beautiful. I'd love to see this room in color. Yeah. The description of it's pretty amazing. And then here you have another uh, spot in the, in the same house, again by Sleeper. Sleeper was in the middle of doing this house when he died in 1934. Another one of the rooms, a card room. And then, of course, the obligatory pine kitchen um, in, in, in the house in Middleburg. And what I loved finding out was not until recently, um, uh, some other uh, uh, work that Sleeper had done have come to light. Um, the one on the right is one of the treatment rooms at the Dorothy Gray Cosmetics uh, School of Beauty on Fifth Avenue. Um, and this was a color that um, Sleeper called flesh enamel. Um. <laughs> not with any no, irony. Not with any irony <laughs> at all. I'm, but it's so, un, it's so not what I expect out of Sleeper at all. So I, I find it really wonderful that he had these moments of breaking out of, of, of his colonial mindset. And another one that came to mind, which I think deserves a lot more research, a French magazine in 1928 called L'Atlantique showed the room on the right, on the left, excuse me, which turns out to be Anne Morgan's sitting room on Sutton Place. And it's credited, and here's the credit, H.D. Sleeper and Elsie DeWolf, not the other way. Um, and Elsie certainly never gave him any credit that I know of. It's so interesting they work together, though, when you think about it. I mean, I, it it they, is very interesting. I'd yeah. love to know what, the, what that was like. Uh -huh. But I thought that was really interesting that only four years after Elsie's taken all the credit for Anne Morgan's house. A, a French magazine gives Sleeper the credit. So I wonder. So, and by the way. And by the way, Sleeper did these things. Yeah. Now here, of course, That's we're segueing into best. somebody named Thomas Jane, who who is a great admirer of Mr. Sleepers and and who who might have some echoes of Sleepers' uh, uh, vocabulary in his work. Can you tell us about this? This is a, a, it's a room in a, for a collector in New York, uh, in Westchester. And he collects very good American furniture and also um, Southeast Asian sculpture. And um, 
he, he and I came up with the idea of using wallpapers, historic wallpapers, to, to sort of uh, spackle it together, if you will, to form a matrix. And here we found a, a, this, I knew this paper from Weathersfield. Uh, it's in the, supposedly in the room that George Washington slept in. And we had Adelphi re recreate it for here. Um, the original is flocked, and this is not flocked. Um, but it's a great example of how you can combine objects that aren't alike, uh, are not historically connected mm -hmm. into an artistic whole. Um, well, and also it reminds me also of, of, there are a couple of moments at Beauport where there's a very colonial room and standing on a, a, a plinth in a corner is a carved medieval stone saint. Yes. Which has no, 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 I mean, so you've got these, the, the Indian, How are I, which are we, much more sensual than a medieval saint. We, we did come up with a fiction that um, the owner of the house was part of the China trade and went off course. <laughs> <laughs> I think Sleeper would have approved. Yeah. Oh, that's. Um, this is the breakfast room of the same house, and you can see that um, it's a, obviously a, a room that has um, uh, a big debt to federal America. Uh, Ferguson and Murray were the architects with um, Richard Cameron as the lead architect. Um, and I, they wanted beautiful curtains, so we made beautiful curtains, but I, I love the, um, our, the dancing elephant under the beautiful, you know, like a presidium. Like, so I like that arrangement. And again, um, the use of objects that aren't of the same date to make an artistic whole. I think one of the things that unifies all the people we're talking about is that they relied on good architecture to make it all hold together. That almost all the rooms that we've looked at, the mm -hmm. architecture, it might be a Kimbo and a plan, right. but, but they're, 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 it's good architecture. And I think when you have good architecture, it's easier to arrange collections. And, and it's so unusual now to have collectors hire design advice to have decorators. They, they often just feel like the objects look good by themselves. Why do they need a decorator? Or of, their, of the Museum of Modern Art School where everything is a white wall and, and the things are just arranged sparely. But I think when you have great decoration, the collections look better. Mm. And, and I think this is certainly a point where the individual things are all great, but with the decoration, they come together in an aesthetic whole. So that, that sort of does, that does harken back to Sleeper. And the I, same project. This is, you know, the, those are. This is a rag rug that no one uses. Um, no, that we use all the time, and the, the so-called card room. And then, every time I see that the picture of the bed, I think of Mrs. Parrish, with the the painted floor, the rug. hooked rug, the old quilt. Um, and I, I th these rooms were decorated about 1999, uh, 2000, and it does prove to you that these formulas, if you will. Um, are enduring, um, and uh, although you can easily date it to the 80s or the 90s, it still has a timeless quality about it, which I, I think is great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mitch, and thank you, Thomas. I, f I felt that we were sitting around that, uh, that room looking out over the harbor on a Windsor chair listening to you two talk about that house. And um, it was wonderful hearing you wander about the house in a way sort of like the plan works, that you find your way, you found your way through and showed us all kinds of wonderful things about the house. When I saw the Sleeper McCann house for the first time, I thought I was just completely bowled over by it in the same way that I was when I saw the John Stone Museum. It was felt very similar. And I remember thinking, why haven't I not, why have not heard of this place before? Because somebody just casually said, we should stop by, you're, you're gonna be in the area, and so I did. So I have to say that one of the things I learned tonight is that I didn't know that the house was so famous for so long, because it's fallen off the map. I mean, designers know about it, you all know about it, presumably. But it's not a household word at all. And uh, it's interesting that it really was. I, in looking at some of the histories of Henry Sleeper, I remember seeing uh, an ad uh, for, um, for, I think, Maxwell House Coffee. And they were talking about stylish bachelors 
who, who, who drank Maxwell House, and it was Henry Sleeper drinks Maxwell House. So he was that well known. He was up there with Rock Hudson or something, you know. I was astonished. One of the um, other things that's, that's really important to remember about Sleeper and how famous Beauport House was, was Sleeper himself became incredibly famous across America in World War I because of his involvement with American field service and ambulances. He and A. Andrew Pyatt, who lived next door, who may have been his significant other, um, they were two very famous single men uh, who were constantly in the news because of their involvement through AFS. And, um, and, and so they, they really, they suddenly had a higher um, level of fame than a, a decorator of the time would have because they were on, on the front lines in a way. And they, they drank coffee and they became gay? <laughs> <laughs> Maxwell, you know, it I bet a lot of people it here happens. drank Maxwell House when Espresso. they were young. Espresso, it happens. Uh, if there, I think we could go into some question and answer. Mitch, if you could just call on a few people, yes, that would sir. be great. Mm -hmm. and exactly the same uh, pie kitchen. <laughs> Sleeper, that would be nice to know. Sleeper made his, he, he, his mother's ancestral home was being demolished, so he took all the doors out of the house, the pine doors, mm -hmm. and he made his kitchen, he paneled his kitchen with the doors from his mother's ancestral house. Mm -hmm. so that, 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 the magic of salvage. So there's a, there's a s historical and um, as, it's both intuitive and intellectual, shall we say. Yes? Um, I went to school in Algeria, and the, the colonial revival there was so strong that those open hearth kitchens, there, there's one in almost every open Indian house, and I think they were copied all over America. They weren't mm -hmm. original, none of them were original. Mm -hmm. It was an affectation to go back in, I think, the 1890s, yep. before colonial past. And right. Enter George Selden. Mm. Right. It was, it was uh, a rage. All the magazines were talking about it. And there were the two Kenny sisters that took pictures of all these things and made them. Right, exactly. Right. The spinster sisters made a living photographing them. So it was very popular, I think. The whole. It was, it was a very Wallace they, nutting. They were, they were writing about fireplaces extensively by. Like Edith Wharton writes about it in the Decoration of Houses, how important it is to have a fireplace to center a room. And that carried over, I think, to kitchens and, the, and then a colonial kitchens, the, the hearth, cooking, cent cent centering. And this is after 100 years of stoves and very not romantic. Um, and, and the fascination with the open flame you know, continues to this day. I think there'll probably be a fire on the ground floor tonight if it's not too hot. It goes back to that. Yes. Well, Stan, uh, uh, one, uh, Elizabeth White pointed out to me that Stanford White was able to become successful because he had enough money to go to Italy and meet clients. And I think Henry Sleeper had enough money to, to make this house and meet people. So I, I feel like that's just one tier of it, is the, ability, the social mobility of means allowed a lot to happen. I, they must have known each other because I think the Gardner and Stanford White are not inseparable, and and certainly there's a famous. I, I think there's a lot of connections because thinking about it more, Stanford White had that famous summer of, of going around New England and sketching houses. Right. And so there's this appreciation of American architecture, and Cobbin had the same. He he greatly greatly revered Boston architecture. Um, a lot of which was lost in a fire in the, in in his in his mid, in his when when Cobbin was in his twenties, I think. So I feel that's all in the mix. Would Henry Sleeper and Stanford White know each other socially? Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
maybe Sam White can answer that question. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it, ideas are in the air. Yes. Hi. When did the house become a museum or open to the public? 1958, I think. Well, Sometime in the 50s. Take, do you bring it back up to this original mansion? It, 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 it was never changed. Never. There's no, no, the, the, the McCann's left everything alone. And, and, and when, when Sleeper dies, Henry Francis DuPont is writing these emphatic letters, don't change anything. It's the whole assembly of the parts, not the individual things. You need to keep it intact. And I think there was a big groundswell around not changing it. And of course, they were using it as a tertiary home with other, right. their fifth domicile. So it probably didn't get a lot of use. But there are photographs of, of, of the McCanns in the house from the late 30s through the 19, early 1950s when they're children sold it. Mm -hmm. And you, you see them entertaining, you see them having drinks, etc., in the octagon room, etc. Everything's still in place. You can compare the photos 20 years after Sleeper's death and yeah. those toll trays are still in place. Nothing's moved. Yes? No, different. <laughs> I, I already thought this through. <laughs> You did think that through. Yeah. I remember. Be the, dif the difference is the Winchester, the, the builder of the Winchester house was mentally unstable, and she was just buying things out of Victorian catalogs and piecing them together with no interest in an artistic whole. The it, only thing that's the same is they ramble. But right. the, the, there's many more dead ends in San Jose than there are. <laughs> in Gloucester Arms. Yeah, there, there, there aren't any staircases that lead to nowhere. But, but I, 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 I thought about that. Um, but Henry Sleeper to, to Hearst is an interesting jump. If you want to mm. do a California connection. Right. The Mission Inn and Henry Sleeper. I mean, this is a big subject. <laughs> yes. Very true. So if, you, if you've been to the house, go back. And if you haven't been to the house, go now. Um, and often. It's, it's, it's well worth repeated visits. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary because there's so much. You cannot take it all in. Kitty oh, had, thank you, Mission Tom. Uh, yes, just what Kitty asked um, the question. All right, one more question. And then I invite you all to join us for drinks in the room right next door. You can either go this way or around that way. And we can keep talking. Does anyone use a hooked rug anymore? I don't know. Let's keep talking, but What's, please. Okay. The street of mm -hmm. shops. Mm -hmm. Was that DuPont's idea or was that Sleeper's That was DuPont's idea. It's, really? Yeah. It's called How to Harness Hornetting. And, and Barbara Streisand copied it in Malibu, too. <laughs> so ideas are good, you know, they're... T t but I, I don't think so. I, I feel like that was done in the 60s, but, but maybe I'm wrong. But again, but you're, you're right. The, the idea of these sort of installed, illuminated spaces that, that, that harken back to shop fronts is certainly something that Sleeper embraced. And yeah. I wonder, I mean, it certainly DuPont did uh, early on in his association with Sleeper. Well, I mean, shop fronts display, you have things to display that... That you bought and could be for sale with Yeah. Your, your, Indeed. Your, your display. Wonderful. I, let's, let's go have a drink. Okay. I know, I need a drink. Thank you. <laughs>